So just before the break, we dealt with the reasons why the precession frequency or resonance frequency of magnetic resonance depends on the chemical environment. What I haven't told you so far is, how do you measure that shift in resonance frequency? So we'll look at first the free induction decay, the signal after an RF pulse. So this is, the signal is proportional to the transverse magnetization at time zero, times the T2 decay, e to the minus T over T2, and then here the oscillation due to the Larmor frequency, that is the precession here is expressed in complex notation here. So where the real part, for example, you can think of it as the X direction and the Y uh, direction it corresponds to the imaginary part in the rotating frame. Doesn't really import, uh, it's not really that important. We just got the frequency modulation here in this term. So this is what the signal looks like, the free induction decay. The envelope decays with T2, and then of course you have the oscillations according to the frequency. Now this is essentially the information to distinguish the different frequency is in there. Now if you've got two frequencies in this signal, how can you distinguish that? Okay, we've got in the solution of the Bloch equations, we have the frequency information, the Larmor frequency in here, the precession frequency is here given. Now let's say you have more than one, reson one more than one frequency, how do you distinguish the two? Take a Fourier transform. Yes, that's what you do. Okay, unless you can do it in your head. Some people can. If you have two resonances, actually you can distinguish the different frequencies. But actually, we'll just do a Fourier transform. And actually, I'll just give you here the Fourier transformation of this signal here. Well, we'll just focus here on the real part. Since it's a complex signal, it's actually stored in the computer as the complex signal. It, of course, has also an imaginary part, but we will deal here only with the real part. So then we get a spectrum, or a function g of omega, which is somehow proportional to the constant here. That's this transverse magnetization at time zero times this function here, one over one plus x squared. An x in this solution has this form here. So it is omega minus delta times two pi t2. That's what this term is in there. So this is what we call a Lorentzian line shape. If you get a signal like this in frequency domain, this is what's called a Lorentzian line shape. Now, so if we take this signal, Fourier transform it, we get something like this. That's our g of omega here. Omega equals delta, that's where it's maximally. That's where this term is zero. That's where the function is maximum. This is a positive term, so whenever it's non-zero, the g of omega decreases. So this at the chemical shift, delta, um, it is maximal. Now in terms of terminology, I'm sorry here, I'm not totally um, consistent with the delta that we've used in the first hour. Here the delta is in the same units as omega. It just basically mean, means to say that there is, at the, the resonance frequency, there's the maximum. And then we have the width of the signal, the width at half height, which is given by 1 over pi t2. Okay, 1 divided by pi t2, this gives us the full width at half height. So the width of a signal has information on t2. Now, the area of the resonance, if you integrate the whole thing, the, so you Fourier transform, then you measure the area under the resonance, that's this area here. This is equal to m of zero, the transverse magnetization of zero. This is, is proportional to that. This is proportional to the number of nuclei, because we have somehow converted Z magnetization into the transverse plane. The Z magnetization is somehow proportional to the equilibrium magnetization, which is proportional to the number of spins. So, think of it in a simple way. You've waited forever, so you have thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization. You flip it all in a transverse plane. Then your M0, the transverse magnetization of time zero, is equals to M0. This is proportional to the number of nuclei, and this is proportional to the concentration. And so I've put here the caveat 
In this case, if relaxation can be neglected. Otherwise, we have some terms that include relaxation as well. But let's assume we have taken care of these factors or we just use experimental conditions of five times T1, then the transverse magnetization after 90 degree pulse is equals to M0, and that is proportional to the number of nuclei in the sample, and that is proportional to the concentration of the compound. Okay, reason here is the signal at time zero, that is equal to the Fourier transform of the spectrum evaluated at t equals zero, and that's equal to the integral of the Fourier transform. That's why you have this relationship, that's a simple Fourier relationship um, that we have from textbook from our earlier courses in previous years. So that's, that's a simple property of the Fourier transform. I just put it here because it puts this link between area of resonance is proportional to m of zero, and we are going to use this um, next week. We're going to use this relationship again. But this, in this case, is proportional to m zero. Okay, so let's do an example. So we'll do ethanol. Why would I give you the example of ethanol? Oh, today is Baladek, right? Anybody going? No? <laughs> of course. Um, so, well, actually the real reason is because we don't always have Baladek, I think, on this day, but the, the, the other reason is we're in surrounded by grapes, right? Or good wine. So ethanol is a good compound to, to talk about. So here's, here it is. There are different forms, but I'll take the one that's for the region. Good white wine. The ethanol that's in there, that's the chemical structure. We've got a methyl group, a methylene group, and an OH group. So here's the methyl, CH3, CH2 for the methylene. That's sort of the electron structure here. Those are the carbons, those, this is the oxygen, and in white are the hydrogens. And now if you take the signal from a sample of pure ethanol, <coughs> don't drink that stuff, then this is what you get. You get the spectrum, so the Fourier transform of that signal will give us a spectrum, a G of omega, that looks like this. Here's our reference compound, tetramethylsilane. And now what we see is that the integral or the area ratio is 1 to 2 to 3. It's 1 here for the OH, here we have 2, and here we have 3. So the red is basically, the blue is the Fourier transform, that's G of omega, and the red is the integral of G of omega from minus infinity to the respective frequency. So here is a peak, so it jumps by a certain step, here jumps twice as much, and here jumps three times as much. So that's just essentially the integral from minus infinity to whatever chemical shift this axis indicates. And you can see how this uh, increases, and we have a ratio of one to two to three. So if we're just looking at a spectrum, we stick a sample into the magnet, we take a spectrum like this, and we're being told it's one compound, we're being told it's a signal from protons, then we know we've got, in this compound, we've got one chemical group that has one proton, one chemical group that has two protons, and one chemical group, similar chemical group with three protons. Or we have three times as many chemical groups that correspond to this chemical shift, two times as many as here, uh, 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 three times here as here, two times here as here. So that is the simplest analysis. That's how it was done in the early days. And so you could actually take your sample that you've synthesized. You have an idea from the chemical shift what kind of groups you have. You have, of course, on the far right, the CH3 the least electronegative, then you've got the CH2, which is proximal to the OH group, so the oxygen is already closer, so it's shifted to the left. And of course, the OH, the proton, and actually the oxygen, is in the most electronegative environment, so that has the highest um, resonance frequency or Larmor frequency of the three compounds. So we will also know this is, and it's easy to guess without putting the labels here, this is something like an OH, this could be a CH2 in this area, and that this is most likely a CH3. If you know it's an organic compound, that follows um, fairly fast. 
Now, um, I want to give a more advanced example because things are not just counting intensities, we have additional information of chemical proxi proximity in the uh, spectrum of a compound. And I'll stick with the example of ethanol. This is now a bit more modern measurement. Here's again the TMS. We have now here the methyl, the methylene, and the OH. Here's the chemical shift in PPM, so delta here. As a reminder, here's the chemical structure. What you will see here is we have what we don't call this now, not just the methylene signal, but we call it the methylene quartet. And we have here the methyl triplet. This is a hyperfine splitting that has additional information about the chemical structure of the molecule that's being investigated. And I'll give you a rationale again for what is going on here, where this comes from. And the main consideration is we have a nucleus, we have multiple nuclei here in the molecule. Each nucleus has a dipole moment. When I was just talking about the protons. Stick that in a magnet, that dipole moment produces a little magnetic field. Now that little magnetic field, just like the magnetic field, the external magnetic field from the magnet, has an impact on the electron cloud. So it changes very slightly, by a very tiny amount, it changes a little bit the configuration of how the electrons swirl around, so it produces a shift in resonance frequency. So it is a tiny magnetic field that's linked to the dipole of a nucleus. So here's the B0, here's the electron cloud, and here's the nuclear spin that induces an additional magnetic field that now impacts the electron cloud of a nearby nucleus. Now this magnetic field of the dipole field of the nucleus, if you take spin one half like hydrogen, it's either up or down. So it has two orientations, a dipole field, cannot have any other orientation. So now this mag tiny magnetic field due to the adjacent nucleus is either in one direction or in the other. There's nothing else, just two possibilities. And so it changes the configuration of the electron cloud in a discrete form corresponding to whether it's spin up or spin down. Okay, and so that affects the magnetic field at a nearby nucleus. Okay, so I don't think this is totally clear, so I'll try to um, give a concrete example. So we'll take a nearby spin one half, and we'll say we've got a hydrogen atom, hydrogen nucleus where we measure, and we got now nearby another hydrogen nucleus in the same molecule. So it is an effect that's transmitted through the electron cloud. So what do we have? We have once the nucleus, this is the one that we measure, there is a nucleus nearby where the spin is down, and once the spin is up. And depending on what this nucleus here that's nearby in the molecule, whether it's up or down, will affect the, the configuration of the electron cloud, just ever so slightly. And so this will now produce two different slightly different electron clouds here and here and this will produce now instead of one resonance two resonances okay is that clear so if this spin here i'll say this is a spin if it is up then my electron cloud has one configuration i will shift my frequency a little bit if now that spin is down I'll shift my resonance fre frequency a little bit, and I'm on this side. Now, because the energy levels are each populated essentially at 50%, I will see two peaks of equal magnitude that are shifted by a tiny amount, a little bit. So I get what we call a doublet. A doublet is a resonance of, of two peaks with equal intensity. 
So that tells us, if we see a doublet, that there is a nearby hydrogen in chemical proximity. Now, let's complicate things. Take a CH2 group. Now we have, and we'll, take, we'll assume that the two protons in the CH2 group are equivalent, so we can't distinguish them in any form. That exists. Okay, if you have trouble with that, think of a CH3 group which is in, in rapid rotation. You can never distinguish the protons that are in the methyl group. Okay, so now with the CH2 group, we have po four possibilities. In that CH2 group, the two spins can be both up, up, down, 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 up, up, down. So it's four probabilities of what the spins can be. But now in the adjacent nucleus that we are measuring, what does it see? It does see um, a relative intensity ratio of one to two to one. Why is there one, one to one ratio? Because down up and up down will produce the same effect on the electron cloud. So you can't distinguish the two cases. So on the left or on the right, you have up, up or down, down. And in the middle, you have up, down and down, up. So you get a one, uh, so, and a one to one ratio is what's called a triplet. So here is the methyl triplet, one, one, and two. If I look at this resonance, all I know is the chemical shift and I know this structure. I will know it's something, a CHN group, and I will know in its proximity, it has a methyl in its chemical proximity. And it's easy to guess that this is a met, uh, has a methylene. It's easy to guess that this is a methyl, methyl that has a nearby methylene resonance. And now we have methylene, we have a quartet, which has two resonances, one, one on the outside, and in the middle, the relative intensity is three and three. Okay, it's a bit of a tongue exercise to walk through what are the different peaks. So on the outside, we have down, 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 and up, up, up. And then on the left side half, we have up, up, down, up, down, up, and down, up, up. And on the right side half, we have down, down, up, down, up, down, and up, down, down. These are the combinations. And they will all produce because the net perturbation of the, magnet, of the electron cloud for, for these three configurations, down, down, up, down, up, down, and up, down, down, is the same. They will all have the same effect on the electron cloud. So we have three times the probability that we have that state. So this is why the relative intensity is one, three, three, one. So now looking at the spectrum here, looking from the chemical shift, I still know at this chemical shift that it is fairly in an environment that is not so electronegative. CH2 group is a good guess. The fact that it is a triplet tells me that it is adjacent to a CH3 group. And so from these kinds of analysis, one can easily deduce what are the compounds that we are measuring. How big they are split is an effect of measurement of how close in chemical proximity is, whether it's a um, one bond, two bond, well, one bond coupling in hydrogen doesn't exist. So it's a two bond coupling or three bond coupling or four bond coupling. The further away it's in, 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 in chemical terms, this number of bonds that are involved, the weaker this interaction case, which makes sense. So dipole that's further away that it affects the electron cloud is, is uh, the effect is much smaller. Or in other terms, the hydrogen atom at the end of a protein will not affect at the end terminus of a protein will not affect the magnetization at the C terminus unless the structure is somehow uh, convolved to take a case to the extreme. Okay, so these are the, the fundamental characteristics of proton spectroscopy. So it's resonance intensity, chemical shift, and I just gave you the example of this hyperfine spl splitting um, because um, it, 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 it's a nice uh, way to know it, and we'll see it again. So now here's an example of phosphorus NMR spectroscopy, or MR spectroscopy. And actually, the first human that went into a magnet, the first patient 
what was measured was actually phosphorus, P31, so the isotope of phosphorus 31. And here is now a more recent example. This square here is now the measurement of the phosphorus signal, phosphorus nucleus in the human brain from this area. So what can we measure? One can measure phosphocreatine, which is here. Then we have phosphoethanolamine and phosphocholine, so-called phosphomonoesters, linked to membrane uh, anabolism. Then glycerophosphocholine and glycerophosphoethanolamine, typically involved in membrane catabolism or breakdown. This is this resonance here. ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So those are, is now three peaks. That makes very nice. That's, I mean, that fits very nicely. It's adenosine triphosphate. So three phosphates, right? So nice that we have three peaks. And actually, if one looks at the structure, this is a, a better data set here. We have the gamma, the alpha, and the beta phosphate of um, adenosine triphosphate. Here's the adenosine, uh, the ribose ring, I'm sorry. And then here's the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. Can you see here? This is a doublet. So it has got one phosphate, phosphorus next to it. The alpha has also a doublet. It has also a phos phosphate next to it because um, it's a doublet. And then the beta, one can just about see here in this that this is a triplet, one to one. This tells us here that there is a, there's two phosphates next to it, just like the CH2 that we discussed before. And this is the alpha and gamma phosphate here that tend to have the interaction, the same interaction on the electron count of this phosphate. So that's the beta phosphate. We have also inorganic phosphate in the date in the spectrum. That's this peak here. That's inorganic phosphate is this peak here. And we have dinucleotides, NAD, NADP, and NADH, and NADPH, which is this little guy here. Unfortunately, we can't distinguish the non-protonated from the protonated version. That would be nice because that would be direct measure of uh, cellular redox status. Okay, so these are the main compounds that can be measured with phosphorus spectroscopy in vivo. The original idea was actually to detect in newborn infants, that was in the early 1980s, in newborn infants to measure intracellular acidosis from the phosphorus spectrum and determine how severe a perinatal insult, that is a birth, a complicated birth has on the neurological outcome. And so, and that is actually acidosis is measured from the intercellular pH, which is accessible from this data, mainly from the position of the inorganic phosphate due to the pK between the different forms of inorganic phosphate, the resonance frequency shifts. One can also assess from this kind of data, creatine kinase activity. And last but not least, ATPase is also, the reaction of ATPase is also accessible. So that's a historic example of what, where actually MR of, in, in terms of biomedical measurements, started out. So now what can spectroscopy measure? We're now going to talk about the application in biomedical fields or biomedical imaging. And essentially it measures the concentration of biochemical compounds. Since the signal is proportional to the number of spins that are present, and if we neglect relaxation, then it's concentration. One does the Fourier transformation and integrates, measures the area under the peak, and so one has an idea on the concentration um, of the compound. Now, what kind of compounds can one detect? General rule is the compound has to have a concentration which is equivalent to one millimolar or higher. That just has to do with the number of spins that one needs to be able to have a measurable nuclear magnetization. The next rule is it generally has to be water soluble. So vitamin C, you can measure vitamin E, you cannot measure. Um, but the main criterion is mobility. 
If it's immobile, as we've discussed last week, T2 is too short to be reasonably measured. So it needs to be a compound that's reasonably mobile. And the proton is the most sensitive nucleus as such because it has the highest gyromagnetic ratio. We also dealt with that two weeks ago. So, now what does this mean for spatial resolution? And I'll just here take a very simple calculation and we'll say, well, the voxel volume that we can use is inversely proportional to the signal that we can get. So if we can double the signal, we can have a smaller voxel volume for our uh, imaging experiment. And you see here, this is a proton MRI image of the heart. In here, in this grid, this square here, this small square, but fairly big compared to the MRI resolution, is the square from which this phosphorus spectrum was taken. So you can see the measurement of biochemical compounds does not have the same spatial resolution as what we have for MRI. And the reason is simple. We have 80 molar of proton concentration for MRI in water, and we have millimolar concentration for biomedical compounds. So the resolution typically in humans is on the order of millimeter, and in humans for biochemistry, it's on the order of centimeters. In the rodent, it's about 50 microns for MRI for, of water and millimeter for measuring the biochemistry. Okay, so why is the resolution better for rodents than for humans? Remember, we have a dipole, we have a coil that picks up the change in magnetization, the induced voltage. The closer the magnetization is to the coil, the, more is, the higher is the sensitivity. And this is it, the, ro the rodents, we have very small coils, they're close to the tissue of interest, and so the resolution is, is high, can be higher in rodents. Okay, now, if we're talking about protons, the biggest signal, when you measure the signal of the proton nuclei that you have in a tissue is that of water. Now, if you want to measure biochemistry, this is not the interesting signal. This is a signal that you don't want. So you want to suppress the signal from the water. And so here's an example of water and phenylalanine. That's the full signal showing the whole thing. You just see water. Then here is the signal scaled. So you have no suppression of the water magnetization, and here is now the scaled signal with some manipulations that are done to suppress the water signal. And so the resonance suppression, actually, one simple mechanism that I want to stick with is you do a selective suppression of the magnetization of water. So what you do here is you apply a selective 90 degree pulse on resonance on the signal to be suppressed. And how do you do a selective 90 degree pulse? You just make it very long. So you only have the resonance condition very close to the frequency of the RF pulse. So it's a weak B1. We've seen last week that the effective field tilts as you can become off resonance and that tilt depends on the strength of B1. So if you make a very long pulse for a 90 degree pulse, a very long pulse, then it will only be able to tilt the magnetization into the transverse plane exactly at the frequency of the RF pulse. So after such a 90 degree pulse, you would have the Z magnetization of just water equals to zero. And then after that 90 degree selective pulse, you do an alpha degree pulse for excitation and detection. And here we'll just make for simplicity the assumption that there is no transverse magnetization detectable from water. That is a condition that one can experimentally establish, but we, won't, we will just assume it here. We'll talk about how this is done um, um, next week in, in a general terms. So then in this case, the Z magnetization on water was tilted into the transverse plane. It decays, you can assume it decays with D2. Then you have no Z magnetization on the water. The other resonances are untouched. You turn, flip them into the transverse plane and you get the, the signal. So I want to illustrate this, what this means. So this is a water signal and a fat signal here from a tissue. Here's the fat, 
And now we'll do suppression, that is, we'll apply a very weak B1 centered on the frequency of water, just such that it rotates the water magnetization from Z into the transverse plane, and then it's being destroyed. And that's what we get here. Now that's frustrating, we don't see much. It's at the same scale. So now we'll just zoom in. And at this point, now we see lots of very interesting resonances aside from water. And in this case, this is most likely something like a muscle. This is, uh, to a large extent, uh, lipid resonances that are present. Okay, so I introduced earlier in the, in the course MRI where the fat signal was suppressed or the water signal was suppressed. And I want to illustrate what you do for this kind of scans. It's essentially this scheme here. Once we will suppress the water signal here. So there's no water signal, we just have the lipid signal. We'll use the lipid signal to do the imaging. Or if one changes the frequency of the RF pulse and centers it on the lipid signal, then one suppresses the fat signal and one just has a water only signal. So just by sh shifting the frequency of the synthesizer, that is of the RF field, the V1 field, to the resonance condition of the respective compound, fat or water, one can suppress one or the other. And that is heavily used in um, diagnostics. Okay, so... I'll now finish today's course by giving some examples. So we will first stick with proton spectroscopy um, of the brain here. So this is the x-axis is the chemical shift now in PPM. And we have, if we take a spectrum of a, of a brain, we can get data that looks like this. Now here you've got this funny signal that's negative. Everything else is positive. This is the water signal that has been incompletely suppressed. Okay, but we know where it is, so we know that we don't want to measure in there. Um, we can see it, uh, see its, um, its position here. So that doesn't, doesn't bother us. Now, in terms of energy metabolism, we have phosphocreatine, which we can see here. We have creatine, which is right next to it, here and here. <coughs> this is actually the methyl peak, and this is the methylene of creatine. We have glucose, which is here and here. We have lactate, that's this guy here. Alanine, that would be this fellow here. So those are the compounds that are linked to energy metabolism. Then neurotransmission, this is brain. So we have glutamate, which is this guy here, also here and here. So it's several resonances, there are several chemical groups. Glutamine is not a neurotransmitter, but it's metabolically linked to neurotransmission, has this peak here, is also here, and then we have gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, is here, and here, and I think there's one here, that I don't know why it's not showing, and we have also N-acetyl aspartyl glutamate, that's a dipeptide, that's also acting as a neurotransmitter, and aspartate has also some function as neurotransmitters, so from clusters these together. Ah, and we have glycine, which is here, and serine, which is contributing to this signal here. So those are compounds that in one way or another are involved in mediating neurotransmission, that is the chemical transmission of electrical signals in the brain. Membrane metabolism, we have phosphoethanolamine, phosphocholine, and glycerophosphocholine. They are in these regions and here. We have N-acetyl aspartate, which is here, also linked to a membrane metabolism. And this is the acetyl group here, this big peak, and here's the aspartyl group here. And finally, antioxidants and osmolites. Glutathione um, resides here and here. Vitamin C is here. You have actually around one and a half millimolar of vitamin C in your brain. It's quite a bit high, but it is measurable. And then we have osmolytes, taurine, which is this compound here, and myoinositol. 
is here and here. And finally, siloinositol is this peak here. So all in all, in the brain, one has about 20 compounds that one can measure, provided one gets rid of the water signal. To give you an idea, in a normal human brain, like we are here, this peak corresponds to 400 nanomoles per gram of concentration of protons. The water corresponds to 80 molar of concentration. So this gives you an idea of how much that this signal here has to be suppressed by at least five orders of magnitude in order to these, to, for these compounds to be measurable. But in the end, you can appreciate that this is a neurochemical profile here, or biochemical profile of the brain of about 21 compounds. Now, how does one measure these compounds? Um, I'll give you an example. Again, we'll take the, the spectrum here of the brain. This is in vivo. And then this is a fit to the in vivo data of a model of the metabolites. This is the fit residual. And I'll just work, walk you through the procedure. This is the spectrum of N acetyl aspartate, of this compound. It actually turns out that if you have a solution at the right ionic strength, right pH, and right temperature, then what you measure in a tube corresponds very closely to what you measure in the tissue. So this is the pattern of N acetyl aspartate here, and these are the peaks that correspond to it. Then we have glutamine. Here's the structure. Glu oops. Glutamine, so this is glutamine, this contributes to glutamine, and this here. Then we have glutamate, very similar molecules. You can see here, this peak is very close to this one, and these are almost the same. Those are the CH2 groups. This is the alpha, and this is the beta, and this is the gamma, or the H4, H3, and H2, depending on the nomenclature that one uses. So that's glutamate. That's here. And finally, lactate as an example here is this guy, this is the methyl, it's a doublet because the methane here is the CH of lactate. So you've got CH3 and here's the CH. Here you have the coupling. So what one does is one has the metabolic features or the spectral features of each of the compounds. And then what you can think of is with some factors of adjustment that are, that are mixed into, you generally do, do a generalized linear least squares linear combination of all the different compounds that are fitted to the in vivo data, and that gives you then a summary of the concentration of the different compounds. So um, I'll give an example that is now 15 years old in terms of when this was acquired. And this is a, an example of Actually, one of the first studies of where transgenic mice were being measured and one was looking at the neurochemistry in the brain. The model that was used is the so-called R62 mice, mouse. It's an animal model of the human disease, Huntington disease. So it's the Huntington gene knock-in, the human gene that's knocked it into these mice. These are the wild type and these are the transgenic. And the first seven mice that went to the scanner of the first seven mice, or eight, seven came out identical. Same measurement of concentration, and one mouse did not fit the pattern. So it was clearly distinctly different. The investigators told us, well, these are all the same. They're all that, I forgot whether it's transgenic or wild type of that group, but they say we're all the same animals. We said, well, we've got one mouse that just does not fit the pattern we cannot consider it to be in the same group. They went back, re-phenotyped, genotyped the mouse, and it turns out it was a transgenic mouse that was erroneously classified as wild type. Now, how is this possible on an individual animal to distinguish differences? And so what you have here on the y-axis is the concentration in micromoles per gram. This corresponds to millimolar. And these are the different compounds. And what differed in these mice was the concentration of glutamine. So the wild type have a concentration of a li little bit below four micromoles per gram, and the transgenic animals had about five and a half micromoles per gram. 
That's not a huge difference, but the difference here is that these error bars here indicate the standard deviation of the measurement. So it is possible to measure the concentration very precisely in a way that allows here, in this case, uh, to distinguish the different genotype based on the neurochemistry, the way it has affected them. So these error bars here are standard deviations. So that's what allowed in these measurements to distinguish the different groups. And what they told us later is that actually because it's a poly-CG disease, so it's uh, GC repeats, and that in the way they, they were running the, the, the genotyping, the PCR, they had some issues with the assay there. Okay, now examples of human brain. This is a brain tumor. So we have here what the biochemistry looks like in the tumor. And here we have the normal side. This is a real patient. And this is the, the, uh, from a clinical scanner. And you can appreciate that the tumor is completely different than the normal tissue. Here is an example of the muscle. Um, a different signals here. We have actually two types of fat. The one that's the intramyocellular fat, that's fat that's in, in, in um, vacuoles that are attached to the mitochondria. You don't see that fat. And then you've got the extra myocellular fat. That's the white stuff when you eat the steak, right? The other stuff, the intramyocellular is the fat that the long distance runners need to survive their runs. That's the, there's directly linked to the mitochondria so it can be oxidized for energy production. So this is EMCL and IMCL. And here's again an example of muscle spectroscopy of phosphorus, phosphocreatine, ATP here, and inorganic phosphate. Was also in the very early days used to study muscle physiology. Before humans went into the magnets, they put actually frogs into the magnets, so to be more specific, frog muscles, and stimulate them and study the energy metabolism upon contraction in frog muscles. So the last example is um, also one from our research. Here is a model, a mouse model of human glioma cells. On the left side is what it looks like in the glioma, so quite different from what you see in the normal tissue. And on the right side is an example of stroke. It's actually more like transient ischemic attack. So the model that's here being used is um, applying 10 or 30 minutes of stroke. So you occlude the blood flow to half of the brain. And after 10 or 30 minutes, the blood flow is rest restored. So it's not a stroke, a permanent stroke, but it's more like a transient ischemic attack. So you've probably had relatives um, especially older relatives that have been exposed to this. So this is what you observe before. That's the normal composition of a brain with all the different compounds indicated. And this is seven hours later after, after the stroke has occurred, but blood flow has been restored. And what is remarkable in these cases is that brain glutamine is higher um, than normal. That distinguishes these cases, um, stroke from non-stroke, one can actually, in the mouse model, very nicely distinguish permanent stroke from transient scro stroke, and even with some of the indicators, determine early on if there is going to be a permanent lesion or not. So the MR field, application magnetic resonance to living organism, started out with spectroscopy. For chemists, it is still the most, uh, one of the major tools that they're using in clinical use, MR spectroscopy is, is, uh, has been, um, is not as widespread used. It is a relatively complex um, way of measuring it. But one of the hopes is that with these kinds of biochemical measurements, one can more precisely identify the type of tumor that one has, for example, predict in this case of stroke, predict if the um, stroke is going to create permanent brain damage, permanent lesion. There's no other way to, to uh, predict that at the moment. In cancer therapy, the hope is, because in MRI, as we will discuss in two weeks, 
The contrast mechanisms in MRI are not specific for the disease, but in terms of biochemistry, one can distinguish neoplastic cells from necrosis, from uh, edema. Those three things are not necessarily distinguishable with MRI, but with the biochemistry that underlies it, they are perfectly distinguishable. Okay, so that's it for today. The exercise, for those who still want to come to the exercise section, the exercise is in CM104. Um, I will join you later. I will first put my stuff in my office because our lab is right in the middle of Balelec and they're closing off the building. So I have to take all my stuff, otherwise I won't get back into the office. So you may be aware if you want to go to the east or have stuff on the east part of the campus, take it with you, go to CM, and then you can go to Balelec. <laughs>